Oh, hello, Mr. Webb. I'm sorry I'm late. Have a sit down. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'll get straight to the point, Jason. Uh, I got your letter asking if you could appear on the randomizer. Well? Well, let me put it this way, um, for those listening who don't actually know who you are. Which Jerry Anderson production did you appear in again? Doppelganger. Right. And since Doppelganger is a movie, it actually isn't included in the randomizer, so I'm afraid... Last as usual. Let's see. I get the message. Oh, no, Jason, no, no, please don't take it like that. I... I really am very sorry. So am I. I'm going home now. No, 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 please, please. Uh, All right, Jason, look, um... Since it's unlikely I'll ever be able to record another segment with any other member of Eurosec, why don't you push the button this week? All right. Okay. Well, I hope your luck's good. The randomizer's been on a bit of a roll recently, giving us brand new series to watch. Lesson number one. Never distrust a computer. I hope you're right. Okay. Which episode have we got this week? Cheap at twice the price. What? Let me see that. There's no episode... Co- oh, I see. Yes, well, we once again have a series that we've not yet seen on the randomizer. Here's Terrorhawks, two for the price of one. I think I better get you a drink. Terrorhawks, stay on this channel. This is an emergency. Well, here we are with our very first Terrorhawks episode on the randomizer, and, um, much like with Grey Skulls, I'm disappointed that this one came up first. Not because it's a bad episode, because it is in no way a bad episode. But because it's one of my favourites, and I know that it's a favourite for a lot of other people, um, so much so that I would rather have left this for a while and uh, not got to it first. Nevertheless, here we are, with two for the price of one, and these gorgeous Terrorhawks opening title sequences, which uh, which I always love. Now, I said in the very first episode of The Randomizer that um, if I landed on the second half of a two-part story, I would watch part one one week and then part two the following week this episode follows on from the uh, very last episode of the first season mars monsters this is the first episode of season two and although they end on this cliffhanger a baby. i love that reaction shot of zelda that's wonderful wonderful puppetry there uh yeah i don't see them as as such a as a, a two parter as such. Uh, generally, I'm only going to stick to that rule if it is part one and part two in the title. Um, obviously, I can imagine there's probably been a bit of time passed between Mars Monsters and Two for the Price of One in universe. Uh, enough time for for Sistar to um, develop her baby, and we're not even going to touch how that happened. I mean, how did that happen? Who is the father there? What What's going on there? We're not going anywhere near that. Um, but also, it's given the Terrorhawks enough time to prepare their um, their big plan for this episode. We'll start testing the space tank. Tan Tan. And here we have a, uh, a wonderful new addition to the Terrorhawks arsenal, the space tank, which, unfortunately, was only used in this one episode, which is a shame because it looks quite impressive. Uh, I'm reasonably certain that it's a reworking of uh, some part of the Overlander. Could have been specially built, but it looks very Overlandery, which is which is great because the Overlander was a fantastic vehicle, just this huge powerhouse with great big wheels all over the place. 12 forward gears, 8 reverse. Independent drive and all wheel, quite a beat. Yeah, it's a shame you never ever use it again after this episode. You make it sound so useful, and then it's just like, okay, we'll we'll put that in the back along with uh, with Tim and various other things that we don't use anymore. No hair. Not unless you count that dead mouse on your top lip. <laughs> now the Terrorhawks' role in this episode is uh, uh, largely superfluous to the main action, which is uh, of course in Zelda's complex. And to that point, Zero and Dizweet being mounted on the front of Space Tank are entirely unnecessary in this episode. They they serve no purpose within the plot, but it's so nice to have them there because it's always wonderful to see them sparking off each other. The baby, of course. Will it be a boy or a girl? And I know I said I wouldn't touch on uh, where this baby came from, but it would be reassuring if they had given us some indication um, 
otherwise we have to let our imaginations do the work and uh, unfortunately my imagination with regard to what else goes on in the Terrorhawks universe and also in the mind of Tony Barwick uh, I would just if, if they only slipped in a line to say you know, she, it doesn't need a father it, it doesn't need a father she can just develop one naturally um, but since that isn't addressed you have to wonder who's the father of this child there are only a handful of candidates, and uh, none of them are especially appealing. What do you want? Do you remember when I was born? Of course I do, you cretin. What was I like? An enormous disappointment. Oh, I love young Star throughout the series, but I especially love his role in this episode, of being excluded from something that initially made him so happy, and the outcome of which is something that is going to make his life a, even more of a living hell than it already was. It's also nice to have uh, Sistar getting more to do in this episode, because uh, she was very rarely used. Don't take my heart. I will hold up my hand and say, without shame, that I really love all of the Kate Kestrel songs in Terror Hawks. I think for, I mean, how many were there? There are like 20 throughout the course of the show, all written by the same people. That's not very, it probably didn't give them much time to create so many songs, all of which had to sound like potential chart toppers. And they've got they've all got a really good sound. I wish more of them had survived because it would be lovely to have them all on a single CD. Um, some of you may know from my YouTube channel I piece bits of them together from uh, clean sections of audio on the episodes, but I would give anything to have a CD or a double CD of the full full set. Don't sit there, young star. You off? It's time! Uh, help oh, me Denise Brower is just so terrific in this role, but it's also wonderful to see Zelda. Um, Zelda panicking and not sure of herself. That's always a wonderful moment. Ultimately culminating in... Star is going to have the baby! Young Star fainting. Okay, it may be cheesy, it may be stereotypical, it is perfect for this series. These characters are just so well observed throughout this this episode. Now for those of you who don't know, I uh, I was lucky enough to write several episodes of the uh, the recent Big Finish audio series of Terrorhawks, and when we were discussing ideas at one point, I seem to remember there was mention of doing an episode where the Terrorhawks weren't involved. It would all take place on Mars in Zelda's complex, with them having to deal with some problem that they'd accidentally unleashed. We never got around to doing it, and I suppose this story is the closest you get to a storyline where the Martians are just doing their own thing. They don't have any evil plan in this episode. And uh, it's a shame that, that either the, that, that we couldn't get that, that story realised in either TV or audio, a just fully Mars-based story with none of the Terrorhawks involved, just the Martians, because... Zelda and her family, and most of the monsters, are such wonderful creations, and... Get out! Yeah. <laughs> the relationships between the Zelda's family members are just gloriously dysfunctional. I never quite understood how uh, Space Hawk lands, because you don't see any landing gear. It just seems to land on top of one of its uh, solar panels, which you would expect it to just tip over afterwards, but it never seems to. This is one of my favourite pieces of uh, Richard Harvey's incidental music for this show as well. It's so very Thunderbirds-y in the same way that uh, a lot of the Barry Gray stuff would be when you'd have machines like the Sidewinder or the Crablogger just crawling their way along the countryside, ploughing through everything. And the space tank, I think, is very much a vehicle in that mould. There's a complication. Of what, Mother? Oh, never mind. It's an emergency. Bring me a crowbar. Pardon? Are you deaf as well as mentally retarded? Oh, okay, that may be one of the reasons the show uh, never gets shown today, is uh, Zelda's casual use of that word. Oh, help. Now, something that's worth mentioning in this episode is uh, 
All of these scenes in the delivery room have never been shown on British television. Uh, when this episode first went out, they were all cut out. So from the moment of Space Tank leaving Space Hawk, it was all the Space Tank stuff, right up until pretty much they arrived at the complex. Everything involving Zelda and her family and, uh, and the actual birthing process were removed. Now, it's pretty easy to assume that we can... Uh, Guess why we know? Guess that we know why that is because of uh, what is easily the most adult, uh, risque version, uh, risque uh, joke ever to appear in any Jerry Anderson series, and that is uh, Zelda needing a crowbar to assist with uh, with the birthing process. It is so Tony Barwick to have included that. It is so true to this show that they would include something so subversive um any kids watching this would not get what that crowbar is uh what, what you're meant to think that crowbar is being used for um but it's so obvious to any adults watching and it's no wonder that all of this was cut out from the show when it was shown on television which is a shame because like i said it is it is the most adult joke in in Jerry Anderson history, I think, but also easily the funniest, because you have these shots of baby, baby. You have these shots of Zelda looking so determined, and she's just gonna, she's just gonna save the baby with this crowbar, and you have these horrible close-ups of Sistar looking all sweaty and flustered, and. Oh, I I can't really explain this on audio without uh, without going into too much technical detail. But uh, if you've not seen any Terror Hawks, or even if you have and you've not seen this episode, you owe it to yourself to check out that scene. To deliver a new life, I'll I'll do it now. Give me some light, youngster. So, so twisted. So perverted. So wonderful. You moron. And then we get the, uh, the ultimate payoff for that joke that she wasn't using the crowbar on, uh, on Sistar herself. She was just using it to open the roof of the birthing tank that had got stuck. We must fire in the next 20 seconds. Innocent life, tiger. Sentence fragment, Tiger. Yeah, I completely understand why Denise wasn't uh, too keen on Mary. She can... She can make good points, but often it's just like, we have to stop the plot so Mary can complain, and it's... Uh, it's never all that satisfying, really. I'm frightened, Uncle Youngstar. Don't worry, I'll take care of you. Well, what are you waiting for, Tony Pitt? Get me out of this thing! Now, uh, Idstar is, uh, for those of you who don't know, is a, um, a schizophrenic hermaphrodite with uh, two personalities, one being a, uh, a timid little girl and the other being a uh, cunning, scheming, mad German scientist type. Now, what I've always wondered about this show, and I mentioned this on the, uh, the Terrorhawks Blu-rays, is... Somebody had to sign off on this idea. It wasn't enough that Tony Barwick thought of that in the first place and said, yes, this is going into the show. It's that he got people to agree with him. People had to sign off on that and say, yes, Tony, your idea, we are doing this. Sensible, intelligent, rational people, presumably, had to had to agree with it. I think it's wonderful. Um, it may be... It may be true that it's that kind of um, dominates focus in a lot of the second series. Uh, and also some people I know aren't keen on the fact that he is uh, just one more piece of hell in Young Star's life that he has to contend with. I, I really like the character. Uh, firstly because it gives Jeremy Hitchin a place within Zelda's family, uh, which I think is sorely needed, and he brings so much to this. 
Is this fellow for real, mind Grandmaster? He is. It, you could imagine almost that um, Itstar might have been uh, Terrorhawks' uh, scrappy-do if things had gone wrong, but uh, we have this dynamic of three characters that we really like. Throw in this fourth one, and it just throws the balance off. So I am impressed with how well they integrated him into the show. It is just one more piece of absolute lunacy to go with all the other absolute lunacy. Um, of course, it star is, uh, I think, the crowning achievement of just mad, unsettling things in this show. I do think also that the it star puppet may be slightly better constructed than the, the other members of Zelda's family. Their head is more expressive and it's able to move more. I'm sure we'll... Look more at that uh, in future Terrorhawks episodes when we get more It Star uh, on the randomizer. But that's our very first Terrorhawks episode, two for the price of one. It, I can't imagine any episode ever dislodging this as my favourite Terrorhawks episode. It is the whole show in a perfect little 25 minute microcosm. Uh, maybe the Terrorhawks themselves aren't well served, but just the stuff in Zelda's complex is is so twisted and so perfect for this show uh oh the voice cast the voice cast i love these guys they are just amazing yes what more can you say about terror hawks two for the price of one and these wonderful end titles who's going to win this week who's going to win this week the zeroids have won i would expect the uh, the cubes to have cheated on this one as it was a fairly martian heavy episode Oh well, maybe next time.